Good morning and welcome to New Beginnings House of Worship as we come to worship a live and a living God. We thank you for being here with us this morning. This is a wonderful, beautiful morning here in Nashville, Tennessee, and I have a wonderful and beautiful guest to come and uh, give you a nice, warm welcome. Not really a guest, but that's a good, good introduction. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome again to New Beginnings House of Worship. We <laughs> want to welcome you. Um, we're so grateful that you are joining us this morning. As Pastor said, it's a beautiful morning in Nashville, and I'm just, I know that it's beautiful where you are even today because God blesses us with everything we need for that day and that moment, so I know that things are just beautiful for you right now. We just want to say um, happy anniversary to my dear, sweet son and his wife, Maurice and Maya Turnipseed down in Florida. We pray that you all will have a beautiful anniversary day and that you will <laughs> be blessed and welcome to the new, the new kitten, kitten they have down there. So let's wish them a happy anniversary. And I want to wish my daddy a happy heavenly anniversary. I know he's up there having just a ball with God and that he's just in celebrating his birthday because he always did. And I just pray he's taking off those Stacy Adams so he could let his feet touch the golden uh, streets up there in heaven. So wishing my daddy a happy heavenly birthday. And then my great aunt, um, Eva May, she celebrated her uh, heavenly birthday um, uh, last week on the 16th of September. So we want to wish both of those sweet heavenly birthdays um, to my aunt, great aunt, and then my daddy. And I hope everyone will have a blessed week this week. And whoever's celebrating any anniversary or birthdays, I pray that you all will enjoy uh, your birthdays and anniversaries this week and just enjoy the blessing of God. And for the thought of the week, remember to be anxious for nothing. God has already told us that he will take care of us as he do the birds and even <laughs> anything, flowers, everything. He will take care of us just as he has taken care of those. So be anxious of nothing. And then don't let that cloud your judgment in making your right decisions when you select your political opponent. Thank you and God bless you and have a beautiful, safe week. Pastor Turnipseed. Amen. Amen. We thank Sister Rollin for that wonderful welcome and those birthday and anniversary announcements. Our son uh, and down in Jacksonville, Florida, Maurice and Maya, uh, a beautiful daughter and son down there and their children. And we also, uh, uh, I didn't realize it was uh, her great aunt's birthday just, just passed. Uh, a wonderful woman. Uh, that was, she was qu uh, quite the character and give you the shirt off her back if she loved you. If you if you if she didn't like you, there's something you did that wasn't right. <laughs> and uh, her father, a uh, great man as well. We want to uh, also make you aware, uh, well, we want to also um, send out uh, uh, condolences to the Singley family, Charles Singley Jr. His father, J Charles Singley Sr., passed uh, this past week. Uh, one of my... Uh, Bulldog, uh, South Carolina State alumni, uh, <laughs> uh, classmates, excuse me. Uh, his father passed away, and we want to make sure that we send those condolences and prayers out to the family and lift them up. Um, our first sons were born at the same time, and they had the same names, or first name anyway. Uh, so we, we, we have a very close bond. And to my cousin, Chris Hayes, we mentioned yesterday in our Bible study, he's, he celebrated his birthday on yesterday. Uh, it was up at the MTSU celebration, frying fish and fish and, and having a good time and celebrating his birthday. Um, we want to make you aware, we've talked about last week, uh, mentioned to you last week that this is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, and so that's why we're wearing our blue lapel pin and wearing blue today uh, in honor of uh, uh, prostate cancer health. I am a 10-year prostate cancer survivor. Uh, and back in July, it was 10 years uh, since my prostate cancer diagnosis and surgery. And so we want to encourage all you men out there to uh, get out there and get your prostate check. Uh, if you're 45 years old, get it checked. If you have a family history of it, you need to probably start at the age of 40 just to make sure uh, 
that you're getting checked and making sure that nothing is progressing. Um, it's a simple process of a simple check. Um, don't be afraid of the finger. Save your life. There are also uh, PSA tests that they'll, they can run to make sure that the uh, prostate cancer antigens aren't uh, high in your body. So we encourage you to get out there, visit your doctor, talk to your doctor, talk to get you a urologist, uh, uh, your doctor can recommend for you, get out there and have that check. You don't have to die from prostate cancer anymore. There's a lot of procedures out there that are available for you. God bless you. God keep you. We are going to get into our message today. We want you to get your Bibles out. Uh, we're going to go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. And we're going to lift up verses 5 through 10. We want you to get your Bibles out and keep them open. I'm going to read to this morning from the New King James Version. But whatever version of the Bible you have, keep that out and follow along with us because God has something for us in his word always, no matter what the situation. If we listen to his word and let it be our guide. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. And the word of God says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, perfect establish, strengthen, and settle you. Amen. That's, <clears throat> that's the end of the reading of God's word. And so for this morning's message, we just want to leave with you the topic, <clears throat> the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the biblical truth we want to leave with you this morning uh, is that when we commit ourselves to Christ, the evidence of our Christianity is revealed in every situation we're in. When we commit ourselves to Christ, the evidence of our Christianity is revealed in all situations. Yes. And so when we, I want you to ponder on that and keep that thought in mind. Because sometimes we really... In certain situations, we don't commit ourselves fully to what Christ has, has asked us to do. We don't walk in the spirit. We, we listen to other people and we, we kind of move in our own way. And so I, I, as I was preparing for this message, I thought about expectations. Now, you know, we have expectations and things. And, uh, you know, we had a, a car buying situation uh, several years ago. Um, all cars are not alike. You know, you have your sedans, you have your luxury cars, you have your sports cars, uh, and even amongst those, you have various uh, components that are added to it to make it better, to, to sell more cars, uh, uh, heated seats, you know. Uh, uh, now you can plug in all of your devices into your car to listen to your music. Uh, you used to have CD players, you used to have tape decks, uh, even had some... Uh, <laughs> Uh, VHS, not VHS, what, what were they, baby? The, the, you plug in uh, the eight track tapes. <laughs> that, that was way back. <laughs> now you had your eight track player in your car, you were going, you were going somewhere. And so there's all sorts of things that they added into cars uh, just to make them better. But our car buying situation, we went, we were looking for a car. You know, we, my wife had had uh, vans, and she kind of was wanted to step out of the van and get something maybe like SUV, but not a. She didn't want a van anymore, a car maybe. Nah. So we went to this particular dealership and looking around, and then we sat down and talked with them, uh, and they looked at our situation and said, "Well, here we got a car that that we could we put you in." 
and we went out and test drove the car. And uh, one of the things that I didn't like was the doors. When as soon as you shut the doors, you slam them, they were just noisy, like metal to metal. Uh, then when we were riding around, you could hear all the outside noise and riding around. So we expressed that to the dealer. Uh, to the, the salesman, but the salesman, he had his expectation. His expectation was to sell a car, and he was gonna give us a car based on what he thought we needed and what we could afford and what we, we needed. Uh, and, but it wasn't what we needed. It wasn't, it, it wasn't to our standard. Our expectation was to have a car, a vehicle that we could ride around in and feel comfortable in, didn't have to hear the outside noise, didn't have to worry about the sound of doors, sound like the slamming and, and everything, and just, just a noisy vehicle. Uh, and so the expectations, the salesman said, looked at his numbers and said, this is the level that you're at, so we're just going to give you this kind of car. Then, then to come back and say, well, you know, um, maybe if you put down a little more, then maybe we can move you to this. Maybe we, so we left that dealership and went someplace else and bought us a car. Expectations. Well, we wanted something that we can get around in that wasn't going to be very too expensive, uh, had some nice uh, amenities to it. But the salesman was like, no, th this is what we want you to have. Buy this car. Yeah, that just it's, here's, This is your dollar amount. This is the car we want you to have. We're going to get rid of this car and sell something else to some, somebody else. Our expectations. What do you expect when you go into a situation? Do you accept anything that somebody gives you? as being normal, that being that you should be okay with that. You should be happy to take this right here. Well, the proof is in the pudding. First thing that we're going to look at in this message is God's expectations. Verses five through seven, God's expectations. And God has some expectations on us. These aren't all of the things that God expects from us. Just be clear there. But these are some of God's expectation. <clears throat> there are some basic things God expects of us as his children. Some basic things. And, and so here's some things that we, we need to look at in our particular lives as we're dealing with situations and, and trying to uh, meet those expectations that God has for us and fulfill the desires of our heart. God says, I will fulfill the desires of your heart. You just have to do what I ask you to do. So when we look at this in verses five through seven, it says, likewise to you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. And so we're gonna stop right there just for a moment. Submission, we have to be able to submit ourselves, young people. Uh, you need to submit yourself to the elders. Listen to what your elders have to say. Those who are wise, because they're, just because you're old doesn't mean that they're wise. And so when we're talking about an elder, someone who's been through some things and experienced some things, those who are uh, dealing with uh, the lifestyle that God would have them, uh, have us all to be uh, living. Uh, earlier verses is to talk about the elders as those who taught the word and preached the word. And so it goes even beyond just the preacher and the priest, but those who have wisdom, those that can give you wise counsel. You're not going to always find the preacher. You not, may not always find the deacon, but there's somebody there who is wise in, the, in, in your church surrounding or wise in your community, in your household that you can speak to. You know, in our day, um, children didn't jump into adult conversations, and you knew that. If you ever tried that, number one, when adults were in an area talking, the children didn't gather in there. And if you came through there and lingered just a little too long, they tell you to go on and get out. But today, young people are right there listening, and, and adults, it don't even matter. There isn't an area that the adults go into in the house and sit or wherever. <clears throat> They just talk about everything right in front of the children and allow the children to have comments. And then <clears throat> some things uh, children don't need to be involved in. And so as <clears throat> young people growing up, we knew not to get into their conversations or, or to start asking questions or jumping in there like we knew something. 
The young need to submit themselves to the elders. Even when it seems like sometimes <laughs> these old folks, they, they're still talking about stop sagging and, and pull your pants up. And there's so many other things that are going on in life. Yeah, those were issues that people have dealt with. And it still doesn't look pretty. I see people with their butt totally out in an underwear just hanging. Uh, we were driving down the street the other day, and uh, this little uh, car tavern of the, one of these buses, excuse me, that had these little party buses in Nashville. And we were riding down the street, and this girl was standing up there just moving around, and she didn't have any underwear on, and you could see it. And it's people don't care today. And so listening to your elders, <laughs> that's, that, that's what we're really dealing with. Having some a sense of pride of yourself and some sense of, of uh, submitting yourself, listening to the counsel of others. Now, here's the thing that I always tell people. Advice and counsel is just that, advice. You have to take it in and make that decision. And when you make a decision, live up to it. If, you, if something goes wrong in that, then stop and say, hmm, these are the things that went wrong. Now I'm going to do better. You don't have to do everything that just because somebody else who was older than you said it. But you should be able to take it in and look at the situation for yourself and learn to make those decisions. God's expectation of us is that the younger listen to the elders because the elders have been through some things. They're experiencing some things that you're dealing with. Yeah, I know you say they, they didn't have the stuff that we have, but we've been through the things that uh, young people have dealt with. And we can give you some advice about some things, about uh, dating, about uh, your financial situation. No, I'm, I may not have my finances where they need to be, but I can tell you the, the, the pitfalls that I fell into and why you shouldn't go down that same road. If our young people would start listening to our elders. But the important thing in this all is that our elders have to be wise. There are some people out there uh, that are my age and older that are very unwise. And we, we don't give good advice. We're not giving advice at all. We're just saying, well, we learned it that way. They let them get out there and figure it out for themselves. And that's not what this text is telling us to. It says, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. And then this is what he says. Not just that the young people have to submit to the elders. We all need to submit to each other and meet each other's uh, expect, the expectations that God has for us in our lives. He says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another. And so when we are able to do that, then we can grow in, in our lifestyle. And one thing that you don't want to have in a leader is someone who will not listen to other people who can't submit themselves, himself or herself to the others, who will decide, I'm going to do things this way, and you all just have to live with it and, and, and reinvent things and, and act like something didn't happen and all of these things. We, we have this in leadership today that you know, leaders don't want to submit to other people, don't want to listen to the body, uh, don't want to listen to uh, even other leaders. Uh, good leaders have people that, they, that mentor them that they listen to and they, they have a uh, good relationship with and they can understand uh, how to deal with situations in their lives. Uh, I'll never forget in uh, the, the movie World War Z, one of the things they mentioned, uh, leadership style, that, that uh, they, as this virus moved into Israel and uh, they were talking about the way they do things in their committee meetings, that if there's uh, nine or 10 people in the room, one person has to be designated as the person who will evaluate and disagree with whatever the, the final point is that they can really find out and not just disagree just for the sake of disagreeing, but have to have proof and some things, evidence that say, we need to consider this a little bit deeper. So and what happens with that situation? And I can hear some people saying, well, you know, we may be arguing about something all day long. No, when you use wise counsel to advise yourself and to disagree and to see all of the possible points of failure, then your success rate at the end would be greater. That's what submitting ourselves one to a, another. Ex the expectation that you're not going to just be a yes person. That the expectation that we're going to meet 
the greater good in, in everything that we do. And God's expectations of us is that we will submit ourselves to one another so that we can be the best Christians that we're supposed to be. That we can live on this earth and do the things that we can love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and soul and love our neighbor as ourselves. The other thing about this, this text is, is our humility. You have to have some humility. A leader that's not humble it will show up and be a narcissistic type person, that person that always want their way and think that they are the greatest thing since sliced bread and government cheese. Humility. The text says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. <laughs> humility should be the thing that you put on every day. Uh, God... <clears throat> For God resists the proud. See, there's some people that, that are so determined to make a name for themselves in situations. In this political climate today, uh, we have this going on uh, in, in both parties uh, and at different levels. But there are some that are just so proud and arrogant that they'll do anything for self. So God resists the proud. But guess what? But God gives grace to the humble. That's good news. So when you, hum, you <laughs> excuse me, humble yourself, <laughs> you will receive the grace of God. And we were talking about that yesterday in our Bible study, uh, that God's mercy and God's grace and, and how God gives us mercy and grace if we would only just follow his guide and, and, and do those things that God has for us. As we were in uh, First Peter, um, excuse me, Hebrews 4. Uh, verse around verse 16 and uh, just a little above, really dealing with that whole chapter, but 16 was the key. And so when we humble ourselves, uh, God's grace is given to us. He says, therefore, humble yourself. If you understand that your pride can get in the way of the grace that God has for us, God's grace says his mercy is there for us as his favor of God is upon us. God is, is keeping us from the situations that we could have been in and protecting us. His grace is extending to us something that we didn't really deserve. Then we can humble ourselves. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. If, you are, if we call ourselves Christians, if we are following the, the lifestyle of Christ, who followed everything that the Father, our Heavenly Father, gave us to do, then we too can have the grace of God in our life. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Don't you know that God is in control of everything? See, when you know that the whipping that you last got from your parents if, if, if you were smart enough and wise enough, you wouldn't do the exact same thing you just did. Yeah, there are some people who out there get one whipping and go out there and do the same thing, get another whipping. <laughs> that, and I'm speaking now to those of us who have enough wisdom, those of us who are followers of Christ, who've given up the old lifestyle of disobedience, that we listen and we learn from the failures and the, the, the things that happen in our life. The proof is in the pudding. If you are really a Christian, the proof is in the pudding. You know, that, that, that old uh, idiom that was out some time ago, and, and, and it really <clears throat> was come from this saying that the proof uh, uh, of the pudding is in the eating. You, you know that the pudding is good when you eat it. So they, they kind of changed that to the proof is in the pudding. So when you are talking about being a Christian, the proof is in the pudding. What are you putting into you? What are the things that you're following? What are the precepts that you're following? How do you live your life? We have to stop going around playing this thing of Christianity. We have to understand that when we commit ourselves to God, the evidence of our Christianity will show up in every situation that we find ourselves in. We have to submit ourselves to one another young people to the elders, and everybody to one another. That, that you have somebody, you can't just be the one telling everybody else and giving them advice. You need to have someone that you can speak to that's gonna, and you, that you can submit to their uh, uh, advice and their, their counsel and do the things that you need to do. Someone mentoring you. And you have to be humble. 
And the other thing in this particular verse text is that we need to cast all our cares on God. Look what the text says. After he says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So let's deal with that before we even get there, because here's here's the thing, especially in leadership. We're trying to get to the next level and, and do things and lead people and make a great name for uh, ourselves. Forget yourself. Worry about the, the, the task before you. Who are you leading? Who are the people that you represent? And God says, I will exalt you in due time. Some of you may not be the leader of the of the situation, but you're working in this a particular field and and you have leaders over you you be great and god will exalt you in time don't try to get their position by hook and crook don't try to uh do the things that the world does to get to the next level god will elevate you if you humble yourselves and then he says guess what uh, he may exalt you in due time casting all your care upon him for he cares for you isn't it good to know that God cares for you in every situation? You know, we sit back and we say, why am I going through this? God cares for you. God knows what you're going through. God understands what you're dealing with. Cast your cares upon him. How do you cast your cares upon him? You go to him in prayer. You go to God in prayer and you have this intimate relationship with God where you can say what is on your mind. You don't have to hold back. You don't have to uh, act like the world does and say all manner of crazy things about God. And if you were really God, you'd do this. And I, I don't understand why you, well, if you really don't understand, humble yourself and ask God the right way. You know, there's a way to ask, ask for things. There's a way to express yourselves. As I was teaching in, in high school, I used to tell my students uh, all the time, I said, now you have to take some responsibility for your situation. And if there's something that you think is wrong with the grade that I gave you, come to me and talk to me about it. But you need to come to me the right way. Don't, don't just come to me talking all crazy. Then I'm not gonna listen to you. But with, if you can talk, uh, 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 honestly and with respect and that's one thing that the one the main rule that I had in my class was respect and I would tell them sometimes they come to me talking about other teachers I said well you're gonna have to no, no matter how that teacher seems to be to you you still have to come in a respectful way express yourself clearly you know stop take write it down if you have to and clearly express yourself and then you can move to the next level when you do things the right way, God will humble you and give you just what you need. So you need to be able to cast your cares upon God. You need to go to God and know how to speak to God. And sometimes when you don't even know how to express it, if you come with a humble heart, guess what? As Christians, the Holy Spirit that is in us, it will interpret those things to God. He will read those things and understand what's in our heart and reveal those things to God that we don't have to worry about how we said it. We know there's no special prayer that's better than another prayer if we are humble and we are sincere in our hearts. God's expectations is that we are submitting ourselves one to another, that we are, have people who are uh, of wise counsel that we can go to, that we are humble in the things that we say, that we do, we clothe ourselves in humility, and we cast all our cares upon God. There are some things that it seems like you, I just don't know how to handle this, God. I don't know the source to go to. I'm putting this in your hand, and I'm going to continue to pray. And when you reveal to me something that I need to do, I'm ready to move. Those are the ex expectations God has for us. Are you in an intimate relationship with God that you can speak to him about honestly about all sorts of things in your life? The other thing that God wants to see in this text, not only uh, his expectations, but everyone is under attack. It's in the text. Everyone is under attack. Christians must always stay alert because of the constant attack of our enemy. Our enemy is constantly attacking. And you need to understand who our enemy is. Let's look at what it says in verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary... The devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Resist him. We have to do that. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith, 
knowing that the same sufferings are, expect, are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now let's let's deal with this because we need to understand that this is not just something that just happens to me. What I'm going through it doesn't just happen to me. Uh, the, our adversary, we did a uh, Bible study some time ago, a uh, year ago or so, uh, about a, sometime last year on the adversary. And we had, had this picture of a lion that would look all scarred up and snarling. And, and we asked the question, what would you do if you were walking down an alley and then you turned around and saw this thing this in your face? <laughs> and we had all kind of different responses. But when we are prepared in the world, in the word, excuse me, when we have been developing that intimate relationship with God and we are, as Christians, we should not be afraid of the roaring lion. We should be aware of him. We should know how he attacks and he can be vicious. But we need to be aware that uh, there is a power greater than our adversary. Our adversary, Hasatan, the adversary, Satan himself, is constantly after us, just like a roaring lion in the, in the jungle looking for prey. So the, here's what it is we're asked to do. We're asked to be sober and village, vigilant. Excuse me. <laughs> that means we need to have self-control. We're being sober. You, you're in your right mind and you have self-control over the situation. Someone who's not sober and doesn't have control of their body, they're stumbling, they're staggering, they, their thought process isn't right. You have to be in self-control because the, here's, here it, here's the situation. If you're a student in school and you speak, uh, uh, just say something uh, disrespectful to the teacher because you didn't like what they said or that they've done, then when they report you, they're gonna say, did you say that? And then now, where are you? On your job, you don't like something that's going on and you decide that you're gonna handle it the way you wanna handle it, and then they find out that you broke this rule again and again, then you're fired. And you're, now you're talking bad against them. You have to be in control. Don't allow the enemy to get you off kilter. That's, that's the thing that uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about football now. And we're in this football season. And it's always, the, the, most of the time, it's the person who acts the second, reacts to something that happened. A player hit them or did something to them, and they turn around and punch them back or do this. Then they're the one who get the, the flag. Or they didn't see the first person. And then we're all upset. No, if you're in, in self-control, the players, uh, basketball players, we hear discussions from them, football players, the things that they would do to try to get in the head of their opponent. And if you can get in the head of your opponent, then they get all uh, flustered and you just go on about your business. You can say things to them and do things that may not get caught. But if you're in self-control, you don't allow your enemy to dictate how you respond. And so we need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. We need to be watchful. And that's what God is ex expecting of us because everyone is under attack. Don't think that it's just going to happen to those people on that side of the track. Don't think that the people on, on the, uh, that live downtown don't have problems too. They're under attack. Don't think that the people who are wealthier than you don't go experience these things. They may not experience the exact same things you're going through, but the enemy is out there like a roaring lion. And so the word tells us to be sober, to be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Our adversary is constantly out there attempting us. And see, here's the thing. We already know the end of the story. Though, If, if, you, if you've been reading God's word and you know that in the end, God says there's, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, all the other things would be cast away. The death, hell, and the grave would be cast in the lake of fire. That means Satan loses in the end. Our adversary is going to lose in the end. If you know that already, why would you want to listen to him and, and go where he is? See, here's the thing. that here's, here's his thing. The lake of fire was never intended for man. It was always intended for Satan and his fallen angels, those that, that followed him. And so here's your enemy is not satisfied that they're going to be there. They want to destroy everything that God has. They think they can do that. 
but they won't. They'll still be those who trust in God. But they want us uh, as believers, as, us as God's children, to be in hell and in the lake of fire with them. <laughs> Misery loves company. And so you need to understand that everyone is under attack. And our adversary, the one who's against us, Hasatan, the evil one, the, the, the adversary, the, the one who is a liar and the father of lies, is after all of us, just like a roaring lion in the jungle. But we need to be resistant and steadfast in our faith. That's why verse 9 says, resist him. How, how do you resist him? Well, Jesus left us a perfect example. Uh, when he was in the wilderness and he came, as he came, just, just before, as he was about to leave the wilderness and, and to take on his responsibility, Satan attacked him. And it's written in the scriptures that, that he, he tempted him to turn stone into bread. He tempted him to bow down and worship him and he'd give him everything. He tempted him by taking him up to a high peak and said, cast yourself down. You know, the angels, word says the angels would cast, uh, would catch you before you dash one foot on the ground. Cast yourself down, go on and do that. And, he, and each time he used the word of God to, to rebuke Satan and then Satan had to leave him. And so Satan doesn't necessarily leave us after the first rebuke. He may not leave us after the second or the third, but you just keep using the word of God because that's our, uh, the only offensive weapon that we are given. No, our job isn't to defeat him. Jesus is going to defeat him. But our job is to resist him and to be steadfast in our faith. He says resist him, steadfast in faith. And when you're steadfast, you're strong, you strengthen that area that you stand firm on. You have to stand firm on the things that you believe and the, the, your faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that he is our protector, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, that we uh, don't need to fear uh, uh, what may happen to us because there's no weapon that is formed that shall prosper against us. And so we need to stand firm in those things. Fear has no place in our house. We need to be resistant and steadfast in faith. But don't you, and I, I, I like this latter part of verse 9, that we need to see. And so you need to recognize that everyone comes under attack. Look what it says. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Those of your brothers and our sisters that are still in the world that may not have given their life to Christ yet, they're experiencing the same kind of things. And, and so don't think that just being a Christian keeps us from experiencing some things in our lives. Everyone is under attack. But guess what? We are different. I hope you see that in this text. He says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. When you realize that they're going through the same things, we need to be different. If we respond the same way the world responds, is there any difference in us? Can we really say that we are followers of Christ if when we experience the things that the world experience, we act just like the world? What does that say about us then? That's why scripture says, make your calling and election sure. Don't stop playing with this church thing. Stop acting like uh, you can go in there just because you can shout and do a holy dance or you're always there and you can quote some scriptures well and you can walk out of there and go right back to the lifestyle that you were living and just because everybody don't, doesn't see it. Or you go to those places where all the other Christians go to hang out and do their little dirt under the table. Yeah, there are those places. You know, y'all yeah, know some of those places. And so we have to be different because Satan is attacking everyone. And if we respond the way the world acts, what does that say about our Christianity? When we commit ourselves to God, <laughs> the evidence of our Christianity shows up in every situation. The proof is in the pudding. If you have 
Christ in you. You will not respond the way the world responds when you become under attack. The proof is in the pudding that if you really trust God and you love the Lord like you say you do, and when you walk, when you walk around talking about God is good all the time and all the time God is good, and then we respond as if God hasn't done anything good in our life, the proof is in the pudding. We have to understand God's expectations. We have to realize that everyone is under attack. But just because we're all under attack doesn't mean we have to act the way the world acts. And the last thing God wants us to see is that showing God's glory. Showing God's glory. How do you show God's glory? Adversity doesn't keep us from living and acting as Christians. Let me say that again. Adversity doesn't keep us from living and acting as Christians. Some of us want to live the Christian lifestyle, but we don't want to put forth any action that really shows that we are Christians. Because when adversity comes, we're going to, first thing that we do, we want to jump back and do things the old way. We're going to say, God's not, God must not be with me. God must not be the God that he says he is. And that's, that's because the adversary is attacking Christianity and the whole thing of uh, God's religious plan for our lives. Adversity doesn't keep us from living and acting as Christians. Verse, verse 10 says, but may the God of all grace, if you're resisting your adversary steadfast and being steadfast in your faith, <laughs> he says, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, after you've been through some things, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. We need to show forth God's glory in every situation. Let the world know that we have been strengthened, that we have been perfected, that we have been established. We endure suffering as a good soldier. We don't worry about uh, the things that the world is doing to us and why is this happening to me? Because we know that the adversary is out there and he's constantly trying to attack us. Th that's why the early uh, church leaders came under such an attack and the, the attacks that they have faced are the same kind of attacks that are happening to the church today. Yes, religious leaders are being persecuted. Religious leaders are, are being uh, tempted to do some things that are uh, not what God would have us to do. And so that it will bring down the name of Christianity. And one of the religions that is so much under attack, even in this country, and you, you say that you're a Christian in certain situations and see how the response is. Well, all you Christians are like this. And, and we talk about uh, not being able to uh, worship and uh, or to, excuse me, have separation of church and state. And can't be talking about this. You, know, you can talk about things where you are, but you just can't do it the way that uh, certain people would want you to. But here's the thing. I've, I've been in the school system for 17 years and, and, and seen how uh, certain religious groups of people are allowed to have their religious uh, celebrations their time of prayer, and I'm not against that. So why is it that Christians, if they want to have a moment of prayer that it's not provided for, that you can't take a, a little time here? I know some people who, uh, in the school system, every religious holiday, they said, yes, that's part of me, and I'm going to take this day off, and they couldn't stop them. <laughs> and so here's the thing. we When we stand firm on who we are, when we recognize that when we have committed ourselves to God, that we show forth the proof of who we are, that God's glory will show up no matter what situation we're in, when we can, can stand steadfast on the beliefs of God, then it doesn't matter what someone says you can or cannot do because the proof is in the pudding. And when they come to check us, when God comes to check us and he knows the ingredients that he's instilled in us, that we should come forth as the, the righteous ones in this world, that we should be walking by the spirit. But may God, the God of all grace, 
who called us unto his eternal glory. We need to show forth God's glory. If we are called into the glory of God by the grace of God, then why does that not show forth in our lives, in our, in our homes, and on our jobs, especially in our churches? So if you're somewhere where the word of God isn't being preached uh, and you don't, you can't see the glory of God if where you're worshiping, then you need to ask some questions. Maybe God has you there to make a change and to bring forth a change. He doesn't mean that you off necessarily have to run away and go someplace else. You need to, maybe you're the one to make that change. Or maybe God is saying to you, it's time for you to move into a, a better place that you can grow in the word. But wherever your situation is, you need to understand the, uh, how to live out God's plan in your life by humbling yourself and being aggressive as far as your Christianity. Have that zeal that that is according to knowledge. That was one of the problems in the early church. The Word of God said they had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. And we need to have that zeal. And, and how do we get that zeal? Well, the proof is in the pudding. If you have that intimate relationship with God, if you are constantly in prayer and, and reading his word and understanding and walking, having that uh, a submissive spirit to the leaders that are around you, that ab ability to listen to others and give you good advice, and that you are humble, that you cast all your cares upon God. You don't worry about the attack of your enemy because you know he's out there, but you're going to walk according to the way that God has given to us. And then you can be perfected. He says, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, Stop, stop thinking that you're not going to go through some things. Stop thinking that it's not going to be a little challenging in life. But God says, I'll put no more on you than you can bear. After you have suffered a while, that he will perfect you. God will mature you. God will grow you in his grace. If you pass this test, then you can go to the next grade. You can go to the next level. God, everybody wants to be at the next level, but we don't want to pass the test. We don't even want to take the test, nevertheless uh, have the opportunity to pass. We just want to be given a grade. We, want, we have to be perfected, matured. And the way you get that is to go through the challenges that life throws your way by staying in the word, that you can be established, that when people look at you, they know that there's something in you. The proof is in the pudding. They see the way you act. They see the way you respond. They see that when they tried to keep you from getting the vehicle that you wanted and try to give you anything that was on the lot, that you stayed, you stayed you stayed steadfast <laughs> in your beliefs and you were established. God has already established you and saying, wait for what I have for you, that you can move to the next level. Yeah, they may not, it may not seem like you can get a home in Nashville anymore because the prices of homes are, are, are ridiculous now. And, but guess what? Home ownership is something that you can have. Maybe you're looking in the wrong area. Maybe God has something for you in another area, another uh, neighborhood. But God will make that a way for you if you have stayed steadfast and you allow him to perfect you and that you can be established in all things that he has for you because God will strengthen you. He said that he will perfect you, establish you, and strengthen you and settle you. That's the good news right there, that you can be settled on the matter. You don't have to worry about what they say you should have or what you can't have. God has settled the matter. When we endure suffering as a good soldier, why? Because we are called to God's eternal glory. How? By Jesus Christ. And that is the perfect gift that God has given to us all. That as Christians, if we have accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are called to God's eternal glory. And the eternal glory of God is what we are able to exhibit to the rest of the world. Because we are perfected. We are established, we are strengthened, and the matter has been settled. We don't have to worry about what, what the end will be. How will I get through this situation? No, I may not know the exact way it's going to happen, but I know with God, 
he will show me and give me just what I need. And he can even give me the desires of my heart. When we commit ourselves to God, we have to stay committed. The evidence of our Christianity is seen in every situation we're in. Why? Because the proof is in the pudding. It's what is in you will come forward. So we need to make sure that we put everything of Christ in us, that we are studying his word, that we're walking with in the spirit, that there's humility amongst us, that we clothe ourselves in humility, that we are submissive one to another. We're not arguing in the church and being divisive because you are a church of Christ or you're AME, or you're UME, or we're Baptists and all of this stuff. If we are followers and believers of Christ, we may have some differences in the way we do the things we do, but we are all in this body because the hand is not the foot. The fingers are not the toes. The eyes is not the nose. And so we have to understand our differences and operate in the role that God has given us. Our, do you want to be perfected? Do you want to be established and strengthened and have the matter settled in your life? then you need to give your life to Jesus. If you're out there right now and you're wondering how on earth can I get uh, established, strengthened, and have the matter settled in my life that I can uh, accomplish the things that I, I would so desire to do and to live a godly life and to have the ability to rebuke the adversary, then you need to give your life to Jesus right now. You can do so by putting your name in the comment section and just say, I surrender my life to Christ and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. We'll contact you and confirm that that is your belief. And if we would love to have you join us as a member of New Beginnings House of Worship, yes, we are an online ministry at this time and we remain to be an online ministry right now. Uh, but uh, if you desire to go to a, a in-person church, and then we'll help you find that, that church that will fit your needs. And no matter what city you're in, we'll be diligent to help you find that place if you don't know a place you're going. But maybe there's a place you already have in mind and you say, I'm going to wait till next week. No, don't make that confession of faith right now. And we will speak to that pastor. We'll send them information that you have on this day that you gave your life to Christ and that you, uh, we have spoken with you and they can take charge of your, your guidance, your, your discipleship and firm you up and make sure that you're perfected, established, strengthened and have this matter settled in your life that you can experience the eternal glory of God through Jesus Christ. We thank you for being here with us this day. Um, again, if you want to contact us, you can uh, leave a message here, or you can reach me at Pastor New Beginnings, H O W, at gmail.com. Maybe you uh, want to give your life, but you don't want to put your name on uh, Facebook Live or in the YouTube uh, uh, video, then you can just reach me at Pastor New Beginnings, H O W, at gmail.com. Pastor New Beginnings, H O W, at gmail.com. Or simply leave me a voice message or a text message at 615 473 5464. 615 473 5464. Leave me a message and, and any question or concern that you may have on your life because this life that God has for us is a life that can be redeemed to the eternal glory that God has for us, that you can live and rejoice in the new heavens and the new earth. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you.